Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, I decided to do a middle of the day video today. You can tell the lighting is a little harsher than normal. Uh, I normally do these at night. But I put out a video the other day that I thought I'd go over. This was seven questions that flat earthers couldn't answer. And I got some interesting responses and I thought I'd take a few minutes and go through those responses. I also wanted the opportunity to check out a new condenser mic and a new way of recording. We had a little problem with uh, yesterday's video uh, with some audio from one of the videos I was playing. So I've separated out the system audio from my voice audio so I can adjust them both independently. So without further ado, let's go on and have a look at some of the responses to seven questions flat earthers can't answer. We did of course have a flat earther come in and try and give an answer. And it's a typical flat earth answer. Do you have any proof that meteors come from space? Anyone can pick up a rock and claim that it's a meteor. Well, that's a rather interesting approach. Deny that meteors exist or they are what we think they are. So let's go ahead and have a look at a meteor that entered the atmosphere, streaked across the sky and hit the ground all in one video. Here, we'll have a look. Now notice that the meteor starts up in the sky and comes down. It doesn't come from the ground and go up. That's where the meteor enters the atmosphere and then it begins to heat up as it compresses the air in front of it. It's a little better shot of it here next. So you see again, it starts up in the sky. That's where it enters the atmosphere. Now they eventually recovered this meteor, weighed, uh, it was about 24 inches in diameter, iron, nickel, iridium meteor. Now the next question had to do with the pressure gradient of the atmosphere. Now this is a, a known phenomenon. This is how an altimeter on an aircraft works. We can easily measure it with a barometer. However, let's see what our friend the flat earther says. There is no pressure gradient. Look for a video where they send a bag of chips up in a high altitude balloon. The bag never expands or contracts. Now I find this kind of interesting because many of us have been on aircraft. We've taken commercial flights. If we have a bag of chips with us on the ground and we take it up in an airplane, what happens is the bag of chips expands. Let me show you. This, uh, this is a flight that I took from Phoenix to Detroit. Look at this bag. Now, knowing flat earthers like I do, they're going to say that I'm squeezing that bag with my legs or something or other. So let's go ahead and see one in real time. Notice the wrinkles in the bag. You can see the altitude. Pop, 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 pop. Now, did you see where that happened? Less than 3,000 meters of elevation. Airliners are pressurized to a little bit over 2,500 meters of elevation. One of the things that I truly despise about flat earth storytellers, and not so much the people that are buying the t-shirts, but the people that are selling the t-shirts in flat earth, is that they come up with these demonstrations to show the flat earth, and they falsify them because they know they're not right. The thing that our friend is alluding to in his answer to question number two is a bag of potato chips going up on a high altitude balloon. You just saw what happened to an unaltered bag of potato chips at just 3,000 meters. Let's go see what happens to the flat earther's potato chips and see whether or not you can use your own discernment and your own brains and logic to figure out how he falsified this result. But let's watch. You know, I just love the claims that these people make. They seem to be going for truth. Now here's two bags of chips. It's going up on a balloon. Notice those chip bags are not moving at all. They're not puffing out like the ones that we saw on the, on the back of the car behind the rear window. Look how high they are and they look just like they're on the ground. So, how did he do this? Let's see if we can figure it out together. So how did this YouTuber that's trying to support the flat earth by showing there's no air pressure, 
pull off this little bit of trickery? Well, we can use our own eyes and senses to determine that very easily. First of all, those chip bags weren't even ruffled by the breeze, much less blowing up like that chip bag in the back of the car was, or my chip bag on the airplane was. Now, the other thing that he did with outright fraud was he put a hole in the back of the chip bag so the pressure had a chance to equalize. In either of these situations, he's manipulating the results to support his flat earth conspiracy story. Despite the fact that it's quite obvious and easily measured that we do have an air pressure gradient in the atmosphere. And as a matter of fact, many of the leading t-shirt salesmen in flat earth do admit there is a pressure gradient. They give stupid reasons as to why it's there, but they do admit it. This guy actually knew that, and he knew that this test would show it. So what he did was he altered the results of the test by um, subterfuge. This is fraud. This is kind of like pea brain tilting his little disc to try and reproduce the uh, shadow of Mount Rainier on the clouds above it. So basically your claim that there is no pressure gradient and all we have to do is look at this footage of the chip bag on the high altitude balloon to see that there's no air pressure tells more about your inability to look at things critically than makes an argument against a pressure gradient. Now question number three had to do with a rigid pipe sealed on both ends filled with a vacuum that stretched from sea level to the top of Mount Everest. If we open the top of the pipe and what the pressure equalized where the vacuum was, what would the pressure be at the bottom of the pipe? Well, the answer, of course, is one atmosphere because it's at sea level and there's a pressure gradient in the pipe for the same reason that there's a pressure gradient in the atmosphere, and that's gravity. However, with supreme confidence and arrogance, your answer to question number three is see question number two, which was the fraudulent bag of chips on the balloon test. You got hoodwinked on that and you didn't even realize it, did you? Well, question number four was the sniper question. How much would a sniper have to adjust for Coriolis on a 1,000 yard shot? Now, the reason that this question was asked was that frequently in the flat earth community, you'll see them argue that the earth can't be rotating because snipers are not trained to adjust for Coriolis. Other flat earthers came out and said, well, of course they adjust for Coriolis. You know, of course it matters. It would have to matter, even though, even though it turned out to be only four inches, which was the point of the question. All you can say is that Coriolis has never been observed. But you see, that wasn't the entire point of the question. The point of the question was, if Coriolis existed, how much would it make a difference in the strike of a bullet at a thousand yards? Can you calculate it? Can you demonstrate that if we weren't taking into account Coriolis and the Earth was rotating, our bullets would miss? No, you can't, because you have no idea the magnitude of the change. It turns out to be four to five inches. All right? So, you failed that one. Let's see how you do on the next one. Okay, question number five had to do with the rotational speed of the atmosphere 50 miles above the surface. Again, you can't calculate that. Again, you can't state why that would somehow be significant as a proof that the Earth is not rotating. All you do is deny the rotation of the Earth. Okay, once again, you don't understand the trap I'm laying for you with this question. Like the last question on Coriolis, flat Earthers constantly are claiming that if the Earth was rotating, there would be these huge disparities between the surface winds and the winds at higher altitude. The atmosphere would have to speed up so much. I asked you to tell me how much. It's a simple calculation. All right. Just like if the Earth was rotating, snipers would have to take into account Coriolis, since they're not trained to take into account Coriolis according to this manual that I have, the Earth must not be rotating. Well, I asked you to tell me how much of a difference it would make. Again, this question demonstrates your lack of understanding of the question and your commitment to simply denying something that exists because it doesn't fit your flat earth conspiracy story. Now, question number six had to do with if the earth was rotating, flat earth claims that you would be able to feel that rotation. My question was, okay, great. In what direction would you feel it? Okay, 
Now, when we looked at the bag of chips, you saw a Flat Earth video that used fraud to try and support the Flat Earth conspiracy story. Here's the problem with Flat Earthers like you. You can't think for yourself. You don't understand these problems well enough to figure them out, and you simply rely on parroting things that you hear on other Flat Earth channels. You've heard, for example, many times that if the Earth was rotating and we were standing on the equator, we would feel that over 1,000 mile an hour rotation. Great. In what direction would you feel that rotation? You've never seen a Flat Earth video that told you the answer to that, and you can't think through it yourself. So your only response is, well, the Earth's never been shown to be rotating. This is a what-if problem. If it was rotating and you felt the rotation, in what direction would you feel it? The answer is straight up. And it's because it's centrifugal force, and we do actually feel it. We can measure it. It's about 1 300th the force of gravity in the opposite direction. Let's finish this up on a positive note. You got number seven right. You can time the uh, swallow along a course, and that'll tell you what the airspeed is. Well done, sir. Guys, this is Bob the Science Guy. Thank you very much for swinging by. Make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there in the lower right corner. I'd like to have you on Team Bob. We still got 2,800 people to get uh, subscribed to this channel by the end of the year for me to meet my goal of 20,000 subscribers going to be a hard row, but if you do enjoy these videos, please take this moment and like and subscribe. You can also check out my Patreon and website in the uh, description. The website's not quite finished yet, but you can pick up one of my nifty water levels, and there are some other really cool things coming out. So, signing out from Northern Michigan, this is Bob the Science Guy. Thank you so much for stopping by. Take care.